you take a look at me and you listen to my voice and being human, you start making assumptions. I know what you're likely already putting together about me. Short, Jewish, New York, gay, well-educated, well-hung. Well, I have a confession to make. I'm not that well-educated. But the other stuff, yes, at, at least the short New York and Jewish and the gay part. Even after being out for decades, God, decades, it still feels weird to say it out loud to a group of mostly straight people, even in an environment as supportive as this. You only have to experience homophobia a few hundred times, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly at all, before you flinch just a little each time you say it, even after being out for 34 years, one month, and 27 days. Each gay person defines their coming out day differently. A lot of guys choose the first time they were with another man, but I can't do that. I had fooled around with other boys back as far as age seven and just never stopped. With each passing year, we added a little bit more to what we would do with one another, and, and after age 12, discovered the great new thing that would happen when we did it. I never tried to figure out the feelings. I just really liked what we were doing, and so did my friends, apparently. It was never discussed, though, and there was definitely an unspoken realization that something about this was wrong and that no one should ever find out. In high school, as I dated and started playing around with girls, I became concerned that the interest in playing with guys was not going away. I had always thought they were just a tide me over till I started getting action with some girls. And then once I did, I had to rationalize it was till I got some better action with girls. <laughs> Uh, but at the age of 16 came and went, and with magic by Olivia Newton-John playing in the background, <laughs> so did my virginity to a woman. I'd always believed that one side had intercourse, the be-all and end-all of heterosexual gratification. Then my attraction to boys would finally go away, because then I'd understand what the holy grail of orgasms was like. <laughs> My discovery was that male to female intercourse was nice, but not, ac <laughs> but not actually that much better than the blowjobs. Maybe not even quite as good. <laughs> Regardless, my attraction to boys remained strong. Even though my straight sex life was very pleasant, it just didn't fulfill me. During my freshman year of college, as a 17-year-old living in a standard American homophobic dorm, I met Brian. He was so cool, tall, self-confident, and much more of a man than I was at age 19 and a sophomore. After two painstaking days of do dropping deeply subtle and painfully vague hints to one another, we finally admitted that we had been with other guys and, after a more honest discussion about our pasts, ended up in his dorm bed under his Billy Idol poster. <laughs> but this time was different than with those other closeted high school guys. Brian was the first guy who ever actually admitted, at least to himself, that he was gay. No acts, no false fronts, no rationalizations. He knew what he wanted. And there was another difference, too. Brian was the first guy ever to kiss me. And when he did, oh, look out. It blew me away, though it was also the first time experiencing someone's razor stubble on my face. <laughs> I can feel for you ladies now. After sex with him, I was fascinated, no, no, more honestly, obsessed with him. Brian was all I could think about, and at finals time, that was dangerous. I'd do anything just to have an excuse to catch a glimpse of him so I could yell, hi, Brian! And, and then, and then awkward, after that, I was a wreck, my emotions and hormones bouncing off the walls like a fresh racquetball. Brian, on the other hand, had been out for a couple of years and was not looking to be living atop this pedestal with a 17-year-old building an altar of hearts, flowers, and unicorns beneath him. He began avoiding me and my longing puppy eyes. Boy, did it hurt. Since we never talked about it and there was no one else for me to talk to, the stress built and built and 
I finally sought help. A wonderful counselor at the university helped me to see that my passion for Brian might be more about wanting a man than wanting Brian himself. He convinced me to check out the next meeting of Gala, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance. I was excited and petrified. On page 15 of the school newspaper, the Albany Student Press, there was an events calendar, and there, in bold print, for the whole world to see, it said that the next gala meeting would be in Campus Center Room 375 on Tuesday at 8 p.m. I kept the whole newspaper hidden in my underwear drawer for five days, as if somehow, if my roommates saw the Albany student press sitting out, they would know I was thinking constantly about 10 words on the calendar on page 15. <laughs> Well, on May 3rd, 1983, this terrified little man climbed the stairs to the third floor of the campus center. I peeked into room 375 at 7.55, and there were two men in it. Two. Some group. Hi, I muttered, hugging the wall with my back as I walked in. 30 empty chairs met my eyes. Are you here for the meeting? I couldn't even bring myself to say what meeting. <laughs> no, they said, we were just here for the meeting that just ended, we're just cleaning up. Oh God, no, they're not gay. But now they think I am. I don't even know if I am. What if they see me around campus? What if they recognize me and point and say, he's the one sinner, fag, <laughs> and laugh their mean heterosexual laughs. But they just walked out, stranding me in this huge ass empty room. I double checked the paper. 8 p.m., CC 375, this was the place. I sat down and I waited, alone, and I waited. Any second now, I knew deep in my heart the entire football team was gonna come in and beat me up. <laughs> I was a sitting duck. I mean, yeah, they'd come in, they'd kill me. Obviously, I was a homosexual. I, uh, why else would I be sitting here in this giant confessional, sweating like it's August? If the killing was particularly gory, it might make its way even into the Albany student press, but probably not if there was a football game that week, too, because that would be bigger news. After 20 minutes of trembling in a plastic chair, my nerves were shot. I could not sit there anymore praying for an influx of friendly, supportive, dick-sucking men. <laughs> I have settled for some not-too-angry-at-men lesbians. I hadn't really thought much about lesbians until that day, and honestly, had no idea at 17 what they were like. I, I had seen a woman-on-woman -woman porn scene once. Remember, this was in the days when you had to go to a theater to watch a porn scene. But the two giggly girls in it just seemed like they might not be authentic. I later learned that indeed they were not representative. Regardless, not a soul, not a man, not a lesbo woman, turned that doorknob no matter how hard I stared at it. Finally, at 8.15, exhausted and thoroughly let down, I got up to leave. I started down the stairs and then I stopped. I had to go someplace I thought I'd never dare to. There was one more thing I had to try. I had to go to the other side of the building and go into the gala office. I had to see if there were people in their office who knew for some reason why no one was at their meeting in the big room. I mean, after all, if something had come up, it wasn't like they were gonna call my dorm and leave a message like, hello, this is the Gay and Lesbian Alliance. Several of us have noticed that as you're walking around campus, you're mostly checking out boys' packages and not the titty racks. <laughs> so if you were finally planning to come to our meeting this week, there's been a schedule change. <laughs> so I had to get myself to walk into their office, but that was complicated. You need to know at this point in the story that during that year, I had trained at the, high, at the college radio station and I had a number of friends who worked at the school newspaper. What does that have to do with anything? Well, the gala office was just down the hall from the radio station and the door to the newspaper literally faced the door of the gala office right across the hall. I would have gladly scaled the outside of the building <laughs> to climb in the gala window before walking anywhere near those two doors. Because if people recognized me in either case, well, they could have printed it in the newspaper or even said it right away on the radio. 
But I was determined, and I came up with a plan. The kind of plan that could only make sense to a 17-year-old or a sitcom writer. I'd head down the hall to the left as if I were going to the radio station. And then, at the last minute, if there were no one in the hall, turn around and run sideways like some sort of strange grape, grapevine jazzercise move with my back to the other office and run into the gala office. And so I did, and it almost worked. I headed down toward the radio station, looked around, saw nobody, turned, ran sideways, and leaped into that office just as I had planned. What I hadn't counted on was a small, low table just inside the door of the office. And as I pounced in with the full speed of running behind me, I tripped over that table and sprawled my entire body across both arms of a large lounge chair. Well, this seemed all perfectly understandable to me. Having been through a stressful evening and just having averted all of that non-existent gay-hating paparazzi in the hallway. It did not seem normal, however, to the seven mildly preppy 20-year-olds staring agape at this new spectacle in their office. It particularly did not seem normal to the guy sitting in the armchair. <laughs> the same one that I had just splayed myself across. He also didn't expect this human projectile to suddenly then yell out, what are you people doing in here? After an awkward silence, the group chairman replied gently, this is our office. What are you doing in here? I thrust the newspaper listing toward them. This says you're supposed to be in Campus Center Room 375. There were a few chuckles. Oh, that. It's an ongoing misprint. We've been meaning to get that fixed. The meeting's actually at 830. Well, well, you need to get on that right away as soon as possible so no newcomer ever just sits there all worried like I just was. Another man pipes in. Okay, settle down, girl. <laughs> we will get that taken care of tomorrow. How about a Pepsi, hun? You look like you could use something. <laughs> it was the first time someone had ever called me girl. I was not crazy about it, but I could tell it was said with something that resembled affection, and I was right. That group that night turned out to be the most wonderful introduction to the gay community. They were friendly, supportive, accepting, and my transi transition into the gay life was greatly eased by their care and attention. So now that my friends and family and all of you know my story, it does seem funny to imagine myself being so hysterical that night, but one good thing came out of it all. The guy in the armchair, Jim and I were together for a whole year after that. <laughs> and he loved telling people how I fell for him. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>